Good evening. Welcome to the Creek Fire Community Meeting. This evening, we will be joined by some subject matter experts. We're going to be recording this video. It will be closed captioned. It will be available to you off of both the Facebook page and the YouTube channel for the Creek Fire. My name is Kristen Allison. I'm an information officer for California Incident Management Team 1. Tonight, we're going to have an operational briefing by one of our operations section teams, Philly Steers. We're going to have weather by our IMET, Angie Anetti. We're going to have a briefing about fire behavior by Patrick Doyle. We have someone from the Madera County Sheriff's Office, Corporal Chris Williams. We have Southern California Edison, Brian Thurborn. We have Fresno County Supervisor Nathan Massick. And we'll have closing comments by our agency administrator, Denise Tolomey. With that, we'll go ahead and get started with an operational briefing. Also, during this, if you have questions, please use your chat function, either in our YouTube or in Facebook, and we'll get to the questions at the end. Millie? Good evening, everyone. Bill Steers, Operations Section Chief for California Incident Management Team 1. I'll give you an operational update for tonight. Uh, so, Starting from up towards Huntington through Shaver Lake down through the southern portion of the fire, uh, continue with suppression repair through there all along in that area. Uh, significant amount of work uh, to be done. Uh, crews are still continuing, uh, just pushing through, doing suppression repair um, all through that area. Coming up and through the west side of the fire, uh, all the way up uh, through that area, we're doing all suppression repair through there. Both lines held very well through the winds that we had a couple days ago, doing, doing very well in there. Significant amount of work still been done in there and has been done. Uh, primarily in the suppression repair, we've been uh, opening up the roads, uh, getting, uh, making snagging through the roads, making it safe for uh, travel for both firefighters and public once it's completed. Also, uh, roads control repairing some of the dozer lines and contingency and primary lines all, all through there. Continuing up uh, to the uh, northeast portion of the fire, uh, up closest to the Yosemite National Park, uh, the fire is still holding inside there, inside the objectives uh, with a large rock band that's holding it in that area. Uh, there is still some smoke production coming out of there, but no real movement in there, just, just creeping along, doing really great in that area, but all within the objectives. No, not coming out of there. Coming back up down towards uh, the junction, uh, Junction Bluff, where the middle fork of the San Juan and the Fish Creeks come in there. We did have quite a bit of activity in that area. Uh, we did have some a slob that came across uh, the middle fork of the San Juan. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were able to get in there and work. We sent the colors into one area that can get out of the rocks, sent the colors in there today, and they were able to lock that off in there. Uh, and then working our way back into uh, Division Mike down into Vermilion, the Pinfishing area, and at Thomas Edison Lake. And we were able to get crews were starting to insert into the east side of uh, Thomas Edison Lake uh, to uh, cut the direct line and, and tie that off so there were no more Easter production in there. All through today, we were able to fly aircraft in there. both of those areas were the two areas of concern right now is that east side of Edison Lake and up there in the Junction Bluff area. Uh, total, we flew uh, 120,000 gallons of water uh, with a uh, helicopter rotor wing and, and worked that ship all day long in that area. All, all those areas are looking good in through there. Coming back down underneath in Division uh, Nora and Papa, back down to Huntington in the China Peak area, uh, just suppression repair in there. Still patrolling, but uh, lines are looking very good all through that area. And that's the operational update today. Thank you, Billy. Next, we'll have our incident meteorologist. Hi, good evening. My name is Angie Inyeti, and I'm the team's incident meteorologist. Uh, so just to give you an overview, we've had a pretty significant weather event come across us on Sunday night through early Monday morning. We had a dry front move across the area. We also call it a backdoor cold front, meaning that it actually moved across the fire escape from the northeast. It was dry, meaning that it didn't produce any rainfall. But what we did have in the wake of this frontal passage was what we call a mono wind event. 
And that is when we actually get a front loose across the area that brings cooler temperatures, but also really dry northeast slope and elevated northeast slope. In fact, some of our uh, weather stations across the uh, across our fire had wind gusts of 40 to 50 miles an hour that really ramped up after that front moved across us. Also with this dry mono wind event, we had relative humidities fall into the single digits. And we are continuing to look at these very dry conditions across our fire through the upcoming week. So Kristen's gonna show you a tool that we use here. Good to go. Okay, so this is a tool that you see, it's called the weather matrix or a planning matrix. And this is something that I produced for the team here. And basically it's a weather outlook through the upcoming week. And it may look like a whole bunch of uh, gobbly looking numbers, but basically what it does is it breaks down each day of the upcoming week and highlights where we're looking at weather ingredients in place that could or could not promote fire growth or fire development based on weather that day. So basically, as you go out through time, you'll see the days of the week are vertically oriented in columns where you see a whole bunch of uh, yellow and red lining up. Those are weather parameters on that given day that could exacerbate fire behavior. And so as you're looking at this matrix out the next seven days, your eyes are probably drawn to the blocks of red. And those blocks of red are calling attention to really dry conditions. In fact, relative, relative humidities are only expected to be in the single digits to the teens through much of the upcoming week. So a very dry air mass is in place. Uh, what we do have going for our fire through the upcoming week is mainly terrain driven winds, meaning that overnight we'll see a downslope component to the winds and then during the afternoons we'll see that upslope component. So not really a strong wind influence expected over our firescape, but definitely very dry conditions and very warm conditions as well. So that's your weather outlook as we go into the upcoming week. Thank you, Angie. Our next speaker will be our Air Resource Advisor, Amber. Everybody, I am Dr. Amber Ortega, your Air Resource Advisor. And an Air Resource Advisor gives custom smoke forecasts for the area around the fire. We use both fire weather that Angie talked about, fire behavior that our FBAN tells us about, and then we put smoke monitors out around the perimeter of the fire. These smoke monitors right now we have out from Bishop, Manic Lakes, Lee Vining, down the Yosemite Valley to El Portal, Mariposa, Ponderosa Basin, Oakhurst, um, Wawona, and then down to North Fork, Crater, and Millington. These smoke monitors give us smoke concentrations or the concentration of particulate matter that is less than 2.5 microns in diameter. So we use the fire weather, fire behavior, and the smoke monitor concentrations to write you guys a custom forecast. This forecast talks about what the air is going to be doing today and tomorrow. We use what's called an air quality index. This index is a proxy of concentrations and it's a color scale that ranges from zero to 500. Zero to 100 represents good and moderate air quality. Above that, we're in the unhealthy or sensitive groups. Once you get into USG, as it's called on our forecast, or the orange category, that's when the air becomes unhealthy for sensitive groups. If you have asthma or COPD, or if you're um, an active child or an active adult, you may start seeing some effects from smoke. Above that, into unhealthy red, very unhealthy where we get purple, and then hazardous where we get about maroon, at the hazardous level, everybody's seeing health effects, no matter how fit you are or in the absence of pre-existing conditions. Once the air quality gets unhealthy and above, everybody's going to need to stay indoors. It's going to affect everyone, and you're going to want to take some precautions. So I'm going to go through today's forecast, and then I'll tell you how to prep for when wildfire smoke is in your area. Today, uh, we have a result still of the mono winds that Angie talked about. We had the strong winds coming from the northeast. That actually cleared out Mammoth. So if you're in Mammoth and Bishop, we've had pretty clean air the last couple of days, so much need relief. Really. Um, that cleaned out most of the area. While we still had smoke production from the active fire, that was moving to the southwest. So areas in the Central Valley got a lot of smoke. However, with the strong winds, we didn't have an inversion set up. So an inversion is when the atmosphere sets up very stably in valleys at night, so that smoke can get trapped down in there. With the winds, we didn't see that. So areas around the fire saw pretty clean air. If you're looking at our forecast, you saw a lot of greens, a lot of yellows in there. However, as we move to a more terrain-dominated wind flow, 
where you have winds moving up slope during the day and then down valley at night. We're going to start building into that stable pattern that we had a couple weeks ago where we see an everyday smoke concentration build up. So what I'm saying to you right now, the air is good right now, especially from Bishop to Mammoth, and it's not so bad in the foothills. So if you're in those areas, run your errands, um, exercise outdoors, and this is when you want to start taking precautions for when smoke starts building up. We do expect smoke concentration to increase this week as we get less and less ventilation and dispersion and we start setting up that stable, more inversion prone terrain driven wind pattern. Ways you can prep for this is check our forecasts, um, check the data. We'll put um, the links to my outlooks every day and then the data that you can look at and find your location to find your nearest smoke monitor and see what color it is. Um, now's the time you want to prep windows and doors. Make sure when wildfire smoke comes, you're ready so you can kind of air seal your house, check the weather stripping and your windows and your doors. Um, see if you can put your AC or your HVAC system on recirculate, just like your car when you go through a dusty plume or a smoky area, you can put your car on recirculate. Most HVAC systems you can do that so that blocks the outside air from being pushed inside. Also, it's a great time of year to replace your air filter in your house. So you can get a HEPA filter or a CARB certified air filter. And even if you've done it recently, if you've had a lot of wildfire smoke, putting in a new filter, that's like getting a fresh, fresh start there because you've had that filter trying to filter out smoke for the last couple of weeks. Um, and then in, avoid increasing indoor air pollution. So don't cook on your stove with a lot of oil. Um, avoid vacuuming using candles, incense. Those kind of things will increase indoor air pollution. So if you're already fighting some smoke outside, you want to try to keep your indoors as clean as possible. Uh, we already had a question on the Facebook chat about Huntington Lake. At the present moment, we don't have a monitor, a uh, smoke monitor at Huntington Lake. So the areas that I have on our forecast that are specified, those are areas where we have smoke monitors, and that's a good way to validate the data. For If you're interested in getting a monitor out there, contact your local air district. They may be able to put one out there. Um, and for Huntington Lake specifically, look at both North Fork and Prather. They're a little down valley from you, but they should let you know what's coming. And Huntington Lake itself, you're in a valley close to the active part of the fire, so you're going to be getting more smoke. If you're in an area where you're getting a lot of smoke, see if you can take a little bit of a day drive and get some cleaner air for you and some relief temporarily. And we'll put up on our Facebook where you can find the links to my smoke outlook and the data for your area. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is going to be Patrick Doyle with Fire Behavior. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Doyle. I'll be uh, talking to you a little bit about fire behavior on the fire today, and then some about uh, the models that we use, and just kind of illustrate it to you. Um, for today, as you heard Billy talk earlier about going around the fire here in the perimeter, um, our greatest concern and activity is in this area in the middle fork by Fish Creek. And then as you come across Division Mike, this area just north of uh, Lake Thomas Edison right on the north end. Um, but today what I'm going to talk to you briefly about is uh, uh, one of the things that we're seeing is because we have the modern winds, we've had this uh, exceptionally uh, dry um, season, early green up, um, we have fuels that are really, really receptive to uh, ignition and they're going to be like that until we get some uh, 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 definitely a significant amount of precipitation and also getting some uh, good nighttime recoveries which we're not getting right now because you heard that from angie that our low rh recoveries at night are super low so what you're going to see is that uh, anywhere there's the fire up here in this higher elevation it's going to persist and keep moving but one of the things is uh, with a low sun angle that's actually going to res re restrict the amount of solar heating to the fuels. So you're going to see diminished activity, but it's still going to be active. So uh, one of the tools I'm going to transition um, that, that we use for helping operations and uh, decision support to the IC, the team, the planning, everyone involved, even surrounding um, uh, folks that are not on the incident and agency administrators, is we use uh, fire spread models to help uh, support what what's the decisions going on, on the ground and also confirm what we, we're already seeing. Uh, so one of the ones I'm going to be talking about is uh, in WOFDIS, which is Wildland Fire Decision Support System. Um, they have, let me move over a snare here. Um, 
they have a, a short-term uh, fire behavior, which is like a flame map, but it's a, a deterministic run. Basically, it's a, you have inputs for topography, fuels, weather, um, wind streams that come into it. Um, and near term, uh, it uses forecasted weather. It uses uh, calibrated information that came out of the, uh, from the National Fire Plan in 2000, uh, land fire for fuels layers that is updated um, for the landscape. And then we also go in and calibrate that landscape so that the fuels that are out here are reflective of what's actually burning in the model. Um, but then one of the things is, because it is a deterministic model, we have to adjust some of those fuels and the weather streams that are going into them to reflect what we're seeing on the ground spreading. So uh, a very important part of this fire modeling process is we have to calibrate it so that we're actually reflecting some of those uh, fire spread events that we're seeing. Um, and so what I'm, are we already in? Okay. So one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the area that's right here, uh, right where Fish Creek and Middle Fork come together, and also the area of the Lion Fire above it. Um, it's a five day run. It was done by uh, Patty Johnson, who was working here as a long-term analyst with us. And, uh, um, but I'm a long-term analyst too. So that's the one thing is I'm just doing this. And uh, so what it is, it starts on the 28th and it goes through November 1st. And it just demonstrates what happens um, when we're looking at it. And I'm gonna convey, there's three different landscapes associated with it. Um, if you skip to slide two, I can just start with slide two. Okay. And what I'll show you is that uh, we have a we use a Google Earth uh, physical uh, map. Two up. Yep, slide two. Okay. And and what it does is it shows you a lot of what the physical characteristics of the ground. So topography is a very important uh, aspect for fire behavior for us, besides fuels and wind and weather. So in this, you can really see that uh, the fire, the creek fire is the lower left of the screen that you're looking at. The north side of the screen uh, is the lion fire. On the last slide I'll show you, it has actually the perimeter, the second last slide. And then the area to the right is the middle floor. Uh, so you can see the yellow is the first day of the run. So this was calibrated for yesterday's fire behavior we received down in the middle floor. It, kept, it picks up on day two, it, it calibrates that very well. And then day, uh, day two is the orange, and then it goes into day three, which is the, the blue. Uh, one of the things about this is that uh, where it's showing burning up into is part of the lion fire. So we'll go ahead and go to slide three. Let's go to slide three here. And the, all right, we're ready to go. So the, the weather that is used for this, we used Mount Tom because Mount Tom is really representing our fire behavior up there very well. Uh, it's showing the winds that we're looking at and we're seeing it we're being reflected on the ground, the RHs, the relative humidities, uh, and, and for the fire behavior. And the fuel moistures were, were dropped down to where we're seeing right now uh, extremely low fuel moistures out there. There are uh, very fine fuels, needle, uh, needle cast, there's running about 2% all the way up to your uh, six to eight inch diameter fuels, which are in the thousand hour fuels, which are at about six percent. So, over that time period, we're seeing over five days uh, approximately about one mile of growth to the northeast. And then, if you'd select click over to slide three, we're on three. All right, you can see now I moved it over into a topographic map for reference for everyone, and it shows that the lion's fire at the top. That fire behavior that this is modeling um, is not really what we're going to be seeing on the ground. This is something I would have to adjust. But we had the, the fuel model for the 2018 reflecting to something uh, a, 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 not a non vulnerable but to a grass. And then if you go to the last slide. Now this is the part that uh, I wanted to reflect. So cool. This is the part I wanted to project is this is where you can see all the rock that's out there and where the challenges of this fire to spread are really being demonstrated in this, this model, where it reflects the ground, uh, the rock on the ground is non-burnable, the little patches, it picks it up and it follows the little fingers of those fires like what we're seeing on the ground. So one of the things I just want to emphasize 
is that we have a combination of using observations. We have weather inputs. I talked to Andrew about this. Um, to get feedback that we model to see if it's working or if it's correct or not. And uh, I think what I want to close with is uh, the main reason we're doing this too is also we're trying to identify areas where open more probably ignition or the rate of spreads, where the fire's going. Because ultimately for this, what you, this plot, this model, the fire models help with is identifying those primary areas where fire is going to move into that might not be easily seen um, except over a period of time of number of fire to train, uh, you know, fire days. So, okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, Our next speaker will be Madera County Sheriff Corporal Chris Williams. Good evening, Chris Williams, Corporal with the County Sheriff's Department. Um, no much new to report with us. Um, we're still working with the Forest Service and trying to get uh, the forest open and the best we can for people to get in and uh, go about their uh, activities. Um, so bear with us on that part. Uh, we are still monitoring three, one evacuated area, two uh, warning areas um, for the Forest Service requests. So those are going to be the M91A area uh, at the Grays Mountain uh, intersection there with the uh, 6S40 that goes to Bayshore Road. And then we're also monitoring the evacuation areas of M17A and M4B which is the Kinsman Flats and Saginaw Creek areas. Those two areas are open just for the residents only. Um, it's still within the burn zone and still considered closed to the general public. And we're just on a continual uh, watch with everybody, make sure everybody's uh, abiding by the permits that are being issued. The one thing I can suggest to everybody that is a resident and in holder is that they do um, stick within the guidelines of the permits, please. Um, we're getting some reports that people are out wandering around the forest area and having problems with uh, equipment and personnel that are out there trying to make the forest safe for everybody. Uh, with that, that's all I've got. I do have one question out of Fresno County. Um, someone asked what happened to the concrete uh, roadblocks that blew here in uh, Lane. That is a little bit out of my jurisdiction. However, I did some research and found out that the uh, Southern California Edison is using that area as a staging area for some of their vehicles and equipment. So that may have been a reason why um, those roadblocks were moved. Uh, one thing I can suggest to that is contact Fresno County um, or the High Sierra District for any further information regarding that. Uh, with that, I'll be here till or after the meeting for any questions they have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is going to be the Fresno County Supervisor, Nathan Magsig. Well, good evening. My name is Nathan Magsig and I'm a supervisor here in Fresno County representing the 5th District. And I have uh, some brief points I'd like to make. Fresno County continues to work closely with federal and state partners to address the needs of residents, property owners, and the community. Household hazardous waste teams with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency are expected to begin work this week on phase one removal of household hazardous waste from destroyed properties. Phase one cleanup is no cost and automatic. Uh, though property owners may opt out if using private contractors. Phase two debris removal is going to be coordinated through Cal OES and Cal Recycle will follow phase one, and this will most likely start in December. Phase two is also at no cost, but property owners must sign up for the cleanup program and provide right of entry forms uh, for work to commence. Details on the process, including appropriate forms, 
will be available on the county website hopefully this week. That can be found at FresnoCountyCA.gov. And uh, you can go there and click on the links to the creek fire. Property owners who wish to proceed with debris removal without state or federal assistance may do so, but first must submit a debris removal application to the county's environmental health department for approval before work begins. This application and all other debris removal information can be found also at fresnocountyca.gov forward slash recovery. You may qualify for FEMA individual assistance, whether you are a property owner or a renter. The most important thing to do is immediately register with FEMA. You can register and apply for assistance if you were impacted in any way by the creek fire. This includes business losses, lost wages, or if you were evacuated and had some other forms of impact. Applying is not a guarantee that assistance will be granted. However, with those who do not register by December 16th, that's the deadline, you will not be eligible if you don't register by that deadline. Any federal assistance that is available now or may become available um, at a later date uh, is available to you, but you have to register before December 16th. There are three primary ways to apply. Apply for assistance or check your application status online at disasterassistance.gov. You can also download the FEMA mobile app and apply. Or you can call FEMA's toll-free number, which is 1-800-621-3362. Fires in our watershed can amplify the need to prepare and prepare early especially as the rainy season is approaching. While in many cases flooding occurs from sustained rainfall over several days, a burned watershed shed, uh, can do the same or worse with a single rainfall that would otherwise not cause any runoff. Residents and business owners should take some time while the sun is still out to evaluate the need for flood insurance, permanent drainage improvements on their property, and last minute emergency actions such as sandbags and timber deflectors. Information about winter readiness and preparations is available on Fresno County Recovery website. Again, fresnocountyca.gov forward slash recovery. And anyone who has questions about what's going on in Eastern Fresno County is more than welcome to call my office at 559-600-5000. Thank you. Thank you so much. We now have closing comments by our agency administrator, Denise Tolney. Thank you and good evening to everyone out there uh, listening this evening. Just wanted to remind you of a few things that uh, have occurred uh, just this last week in regards to the forest, uh, Sierra National Forest. One of those things is after uh, considerable consideration or thought processes and talking with the incident management team that's here right now, as well as with the, the line staff that's here on the Sierra National Forest, uh, the forest supervisor signed into effect a, a, a modification to the forest closure order that we have here on Sierra National Forest. That forest order still remains the same. Uh, the, the new date for expiration to that forest closure order will be November 9th, 2020. Uh, we know that that disappoints some folks that have wanted to come up and visit to visit the forest and do the activities that they are so familiar with doing out on the forest. But because of some of the conditions that we still have out on the creek fire, we could only open up a portion of the forest for you to do so. Uh, we, we are taking that good close look every single day to ensure that we, we are appropriately either opening or remaining closure orders for particular areas on the Sierra National Forest. As we do those daily checks, we will, as soon as we possibly can, open up portions of the Sierra for folks to enjoy again um, after the creek fire has come through. Uh, after that, the next thing is we are still issuing um, access permits into the forest closure area. Please continue to go to the Sierra National Forest website um, on the internet and or call any one of our three offices to get information in regards to those access permits. 
with that, have a good evening, and uh, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have in regards to the Sierra National Forest. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our presentations. We will now be using the chat functions to take questions. And many of those questions have been answered via chat. So we'll give you just a couple minutes here to go ahead and ask any questions that you still have. Okay, we have a couple questions coming in. So again, my name is Nathan Magsigan. I'm a supervisor here in Fresno County. One of the questions is uh, regarding uh, Madera County, uh, Supervisor Tom Wheeler. And I spoke with Tom Wheeler today, and I know that uh, he would like to be here, but sometimes uh, there um, are other issues and events that, uh, that come up. So in regards to Tom Wheeler, I know that he's very much engaged on the Madera side of this fire. He does represent the area that's being impacted. Uh, but like I said, I spoke with Tom Wheeler today. He and I stay in close contact uh, since both Tom Wheeler and myself are the supervisors that uh, are, are most impacted by this fire on the Fresno County side and Madera, Madera County side as far as elected officials go. So hopefully that answers your question. Well, with that, uh, we don't have any other questions. We've been using the chat to be able to get your questions. We are going to have some closing comments by our incident commander, Jerry McGowan. Good evening, again, my name is Jerry McGowan. I'm the incident commander for California Incident Management Team 1 and currently um, the Chief Fire Incident Command. A couple of updates. One is uh, the uh, we're going to be transitioning. Our tour is over. We've spent some, quite a bit of time here, and uh, we'll be transitioning with another team here in the next couple of days, and, and making sure that they uh, that we continue with the operation just as well as what we've done. One of the things I don't know if it's really been emphasized, other than that, um, the, the, the supervisor was talking about was the uh, the watershed protection and all that. Again, when, when the operations was talking about repair, there's quite a bit of a work, a lot of work, in fact, going on repair all the way around this incident. Um, with that being said, it's currently at about 58% complete, uh, according to our calculations. So there's a lot, still a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of work that's been done, and there's a lot of good, good actions across this thing that have occurred. Well, uh, the other thing is, is that, um, again, there was a question about 63% containment. Uh, it's been, been taking uh, time from what I understand. Again, most of this, as it was described, most of the fires was within the, uh, the wilderness areas. And with that, there's a lot of strategic operations going on right there. This is a full suppression fire. There's, there is not any managed fire or, or any of that kind of stuff. We're letting it just free wheel. But we are using... We are trying to be smart in the sense of using a lot of the rock out copies and all that and not exposing um, as many firefighters into um, some rough, rugged country. Um, and and uh, what we're doing is trying to tie it up in the rocks as they're saying and put some crews up into here and up here so it doesn't go anywhere. And as you, as you were told by the, uh, the fire behavior analyst, that, that uh, there's not a lot of spread that's going in there. Is there going to be some little smoke? Yeah, but this is going to have to cook off a little bit here in, the, in this area and, um, and, and and get to those rocks. And that's primarily why we're doing it, is just for the exposure. A lot of it's the primary exposure to those fireplaces. With that, um, I hope we served you well. So there's a lot of firefighters putting a lot of hours in there. And um, um, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jerry. Again, this presentation video will be available on Facebook Live and also on our YouTube channel for the Creek Fire. We will close caption it and we'll have it up as soon as it's ready. Thank you and have a good evening.